welcome to another edition of Crosstalk, your 6th Plymouth District edition with your state representative, Josh Cutler. He returns uh, for yet another legislative session. Sir. Thanks, Kevin. Glad welcome to be back. back. Ah, good to see Pleasure. you. Likewise. The senior legislator here on the South Shore. You're just saying that because of my gray hair, I know. It's well, it's a little bit of it, yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I mean, you're somebody who is uh, four terms? This is my fourth term, starting my fourth term, yeah. yeah. And you've, we've seen a lot of folks who have left. you got new faces. Yeah, some new colleagues, yeah. It's great to have. What's it like to be the, the, the senior legislator? <laughs> just somebody who, I mean, we know we've, we lost the likes of Jim Cantwell. Yeah. Well-respected. Yeah. Um, Tom Coulter. You know, individuals like that, and now you're kind of the... Sure, now we have a lot of new faces, which is uh, the sort of the natural order of things, and that's totally great. Um, and uh, there's still plenty of colleagues who have a lot more seniority than me. So <laughs> but uh, it's nice. We have some new folks, um, new rep here in Whitman, um, Representative Sullivan, uh, great to work with her, and new reps uh, in Kingston, Representative Lenatra, and um, all over the South that Shore. So right. Yeah, so we got a good crew, and it's nice to... Uh, to, uh, you know, I miss my old friends, but I still talk to them. And, but it's nice to have some new folks to work with as well. Talk to me about the, the start of the new legislative uh, session. What's it like for you uh, as a legislator? I mean, it's become old hat. You kind of already know the process. You walk in, you do the swearing in before you know it. You're talking about authoring and sponsoring and filing yeah. bills. So, yeah, no, it's definitely not old hat. I mean, I still get think it's cool <laughs> to be in this position. It's, a, it's really an honor to be able to serve and to help to be a voice for our constituents and have a chance to weigh in on issue, issues that are, you know, of importance locally and also, you know, also statewide and sometimes even, you know, across the, the country. So, um, no, I think it's tremendous and I really enjoy the job. And, um, but yeah, so it's been new start, new session just started, back to work. We um, just had our bill filing period. And so um, everyone's kind of busy drafting legislation and co-sponsoring other folks bills and um, so now we're kind of moving into the committee phase where we'll get a, we've been assigned to committees and we'll start to schedule hearings and have uh, opportunity to learn more about all the you know 4,000 plus bills that have that have just been filed. Now, were you able to retain your committee assignments? Did you gain any new yes. prestige? I mean are you a chair or co-chair of any committee? Sure so yeah no I, I was to have some great committee assignments um, Number one, I, I, I um, re returned as a member of the Ways and Means Committee, wow. which is um, you know, which is the budget writing committee. So Very that's prestigious, kind of, though. It's an important committee for sure. Um, so that that that's great, especially now being my second term. I kind of have gone through it all once, and uh, so I know the ropes there. Um, was also pleased to be reappointed to um, the Cal Telecommunications, Utilities, and Energy Committee, which is a, a mouthful. Um, telecom committee, we call it, but that is one that I've been on uh, for the past two terms. And energy issues are something that are a particular interest of mine and uh, always in the forefront. So that is a, 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 a key committee. And new this term, I was appointed to serve on the um, Higher Education Committee, which is something that's new for me. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about school funding, both at the K-12 level, but also um, for higher ed, uh, trying to do something to control the costs of college. And so that's going to be something I'm looking forward to kind of getting to dive into that area. So that's, that was new. Um, and then I was appointed as vice chairman of uh, a committee, a new committee, uh, the Children, Families, and Persons with um, Disabilities Committee. So that committee has broad oversight over a number of state agencies, including uh, DCF, DMH, DTA, um, it's a whole <laughs> alphabet soup, um, a number of uh, six or seven um, of the um, you know, biggest state agencies. Um, so that's a lot of, uh, of new policy work as well. So I'm excited to be serving as vice chair in a leadership role there and able to work with my colleagues uh, uh, on those issues. So, so cool. Very pleased with my committee assignments. Yeah. So the one thing that I, I would ask you, you actually mentioned it real quick in regards to filing bills. I, I get here a number that you said, did you filed 30 bills? So I filed, I believe, 32 bills. Um, my, there were bills that I did or that I did with a, a joint sponsor. In, in a couple of cases, I did do bills with, um, I did a, a bill together with Representative Allison Sullivan, another bill together with Representative Kathy Lenatra. Uh, so that was 32. And then um, 
obviously folks co-sponsor other people's bills, and uh, I think I co-sponsored about 150 bills that other people had, had um, drafted. Uh, in all, I believe there's more than 4,000 bills that have been filed so far, and that's just, you know, as of now. There'll be more bills that get added later on as we go through the session. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of material to look through, <laughs> a lot of good ideas, probably some, some clunkers in there too, but uh, that's our job is to, you know, to weigh them all. Anything that you might have refiled in the past? Because we know that when, when a bill is filed, it goes through a process. And it may, you know, during the legislative session, it may get, it, it may be bundled in with something. It may not make it out of committee. Anything that you've been working on the past couple of uh, sessions that you're like, I know this one has a chance. People have seen it. It's getting recognition. Yeah, so uh, there's a number of bills um, that fall into that category and some, some new ones as well that I'd love mm -hmm. to chat about. But uh, one example, um, we talked off camera about school funding issues yep. and how we can do more to bring in more dollars to our school districts, you know, locally here, Whitman Hanson and Pembroke and Duxbury and all over the, the South Shore. And so I filed a bill last term to increase what's called the minimum per pupil increment, which you know, gets into the weeds a little bit, but it has to do with Chapter 70 funding formula, which is the way we give money back to our uh, school districts across the Commonwealth through the Chapter 70 foundation budget. Folks may have heard that term tossed around. Mm. Um, and many school districts, 200 plus school districts around the state, the only way they get more funding year to year is through this calculation called the minimum per pupil increment. And so um, in the past that has been sort of range from a low of $20 up to you know $50. And so I have a bill that I filed last term to actually statutorily set the, th the floor at $50 per pupil so that our schools would kind of know at least the minimum level going forward when they're drafting their budget so they can at least count on getting this much of an increase in funding year to year. Um, and hopefully higher, but at least have a, a floor. Um, so that was a bill that I filed last term, and this term I was pleased to see um, there's a much broader bill called the Fund Our Future Act that the, the Teachers Association and a number of other groups are advocating, and they actually have adopted that $50 level, and, uh, along with another of other, uh, a number of other items, mm. and put it in as an omnibus bill. So that's a good example of what you talked about, where um, you, know, you have a, a small idea, and it may get wrapped into a bigger set of uh, ideas that, that get you know, kind of bundled together as a package. And I'm um, so hopeful that that will be included in the bill. Uh, number one, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to move the Fund Our Future bill forward to you know, bring more funding for our schools in general. But I'm also hopeful that it will include that $50 per pupil that, um, that I and many others, not just myself, but uh, that we've been advocating for. So that's one example. There's a lot of other bills that we've been working on um, that um, where that is the case. And frankly, more often than not, Kevin, um, what happens when you file a bill is it doesn't just kind of get passed on its own. It, it more often than not becomes part of something broader. And that's how you try to look for ways to get things done through the process. Yeah, and you're talking about bills. Um, th there's one bill that was filed called the, the Mass Made Bill. Talk to me about that. Yeah, so uh, actually Representative Kathy Lenatra, who's one of our, our new colleagues from, um, from Kingston, mm -hmm. I think she has six different towns, Kingston, part of Duxbury, Plymouth, yeah, it's uh, Halifax. Right the, it's the 12th <laughs> Plymouth District, <laughs> the 12th right? Plymouth District. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Middleborough, uh, Lakeville, oh my goodness. Yes. A ton of them. A ton of them. Uh, so we filed a bill together called uh, the Mass Made Bill. And basically this is an idea that uh, a former senator um, who I worked with last term had, had worked on. Uh, and basically it's to create a branding program for goods and products that are manufactured or created or grown here in Massachusetts. And um, other states have done something similar. Um, and the whole idea is to promote locally sourced products by having a branding program called Made in Massachusetts so that you'd literally have a logo. And I actually, I drafted a, just an example mock-up. Um, maybe we can, the great folks back in the studio can put it on the Chiron. Um, the, um, to promote the fact that a product was grown or produced here in Massachusetts. Because, you know, when we go to shop, we don't always know what's made locally. And, you know, for many folks, it would make a difference if they saw that a product, you know, product A was produced here in Massachusetts and product B wasn't. And so all things being equal, obviously, we'd rather support our, you know, homegrown businesses. And so creating this mass-made program under our an existing Office of Business Development is the goal of this legislation, it would create a website so that if you were a, uh, a business that produced, you know, some good, you could apply if you wish. Totally optional, voluntary. You could apply, 
and um, get qualified as a made in Massachusetts uh, product, and then you could put that branding on your on your product however you wished. So that's kind of the the impetus behind the bill as a way to promote you know buy local. We always hear talk about the importance of buying local. Indeed. And this is a way to help folks to identify products that are made locally. So that's the made in Massachusetts um, bill, and um, I'm hopeful that we can get some good progress on that this term. Knowing that you serve on a, a committee that deals with energy, I believe there's also a, a, an Energy Save Act that uh, is in the works too, correct? Yeah, so uh, that, this is a great example of, of something that um, came from a constituent. Uh, in fact, a Hanson resident, Marianne Damasio, who is very much involved through her work uh, on appliance efficiency standards, mm -hmm. uh, basically making our everyday appliances more efficient, more energy efficient. Um, the best kind of energy is the energy you don't use in the first place, if you think about it that way. Uh, that's the best way to you know, save money, but also save, you know, uh, save our planet and, uh, and tackle climate change. So trying to reduce our energy footprint, so to speak. Um, so she and her the business that she works with has been advocating for a series of um, uh, bills to um, promote energy efficiency in our appliances here in Massachusetts. We haven't updated most of our appliance standards in uh, seven to ten years, so we're kind of due for that. And um, so I filed a bill along with um, a counterpart in the Senate to uh, update our appliance energy efficiency standards. Again, it's kind of a mouthful, but uh, it's important stuff. Everyday appliances like, you know, toilets, shower heads, uh, food grillers, um, uh, air purifiers, things like that, some of those uh, various products. And just making so that when you go to buy one, whether it's Lowe's, Home Depot, local hardware store, or wherever, you can have um, energy efficient products to choose from. And many folks are familiar with um, the Energy Star label, for instance, or EPA's WaterSense uh, brand. Those are all examples of products that are energy efficient that our bill would support. And so any product like that would qualify for um, these uh, upgraded standards. And so the whole idea is to sort of wean out the least efficient products in the marketplace so that when consumers go to pick, they have energy efficient products to pick from and can um, you know, have chances to save money on their own energy costs. So we're trying to update our standards. Um, it's called the Mass Energy Save Act, and um, it stands for Saving Appliance uh, Savings, Energy Savings, and uh, and I just blew the last of the E. <laughs> inefficiency, yes, there we go. Energy Savings and Efficiency Act, uh, Mass Save. So um, that's something we're working on, and we have a good coalition of folks, um, good uh, bipartisan bill with a lot of support from folks in the consumer in, uh, side of things, in the uh, energy side of things, um, the business side of things. So I'm um, really excited about this, this bill and looking forward to trying to do some good stuff in that arena. It's interesting you ma mentioned Mary Ann Damasio, who yes. is, she actually hosts her own show called The Green Scene. Be sure to yeah, look at you your-, your uh, Cross promotion there, Kevin. Well, she's, she's got a show that's upcoming and the, the show is dealing with, it's something that a lot of communities are delving into, and that is, is the elimination of plastic bags. Ah, uh, yes, plastic and bags. so yes. she's looking to uh, mobilize and get folks involved in regards to that, and I'm not sure if it's something that she's, an initiative she's looking to spread Two into. Two of my towns have, have done that. Duxbury. Uh, Duxbury did that, and then Pembroke just recently. Um, and um, that's something that I definitely see percolating. Mm -hmm. uh, many other cities and towns around the state have done um, bag legislation, mostly ban, per, you know, banning the, 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 the cheap uh, plastic bags. Some cities and towns have done something a little bit different. And there are a number of bills at the State House. Um, some would, would um, extend that ban statewide. Others would actually allow you to buy them with a you know, nickel or dime fee. Um, there's different approaches to that. Um, and I think that's something that we'll see, you know, whether it's this term or next term, that will be looked at pretty hard because I know that that's an issue that's gaining traction as we look at, you know, sort of plastic bags and the, the waste that they create. And, um, you know, they seem to last forever, unfortunately. So we're trying to do something about them. But Any other bills of, of note that you want to you mention in regards to stuff that you filed, that you're working on, that you, maybe you sponsored or co-sponsored? Uh, yeah, so let's see. Um, one bill that uh, I'm working on, um, which I've done in the past, but have good hopes for this term, has to do with uh, offshore tax havens. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, folks, you know, Folks may be familiar with, you know, we kind of read the news about all this money that's um, uh, shipped overseas to low tax jurisdictions. Places like, I know you recently went on a vacation in some places where uh, we all would love to visit, and they're great places like the Cayman Islands or Bermuda or so forth, but they mm -hmm. um, are low tax jurisdictions. And so we have companies that are 
you know, earning profits here in Massachusetts, and then so it's sort of essentially offshore those profits to low tax or no tax jurisdictions to avoid paying their fair share of corporate tax here in Massachusetts. So uh, it's something that um, I know in Washington, D.C. has been a hot topic. Late Senator John McCain was one of the leading proponents of trying to do this on a, on a national level. Uh, but there are some areas of the tax code we can actually uh, address here in Massachusetts at the state level. And so I filed a bill the last uh, couple terms having to do with, uh, um, it's called the Water's Edge Loophole, uh, having to do with offshore tax havens for our corporate taxes. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea is to help, is to help our you know, small and mid-sized businesses that are paying their share of, of our corporate state tax, um, but have to compete against businesses that are much bigger that oftentimes are not paying their share of tax, and in, in some cases, they're paying next to nothing mm. in corporate taxes because they have you know enough accountants and enough lawyers to to um, to offshore their tax um, liability. So, um, working on this bill, um, it's a complicated topic as you can imagine, and I uh, just got the bill back from House Counsel with some um, updates on it. So that's something I'm working on, trying to um, trying to get uh, done for this term as well. One of the little side conversations we had prior to going on camera was uh, you're working with uh, the, the new representative who you share a school district with, uh, Allison Sullivan, because yes. she does a, a, her, her own crosstalk show now. Um, and I think you said that- Wait, you do I, other crosstalk shows, Kevin? I'm not the only one? Uh, it's part of a product line. Wait, yeah, I'm yeah. not the only one? I thought I was special. You are special <laughs> in your own way. You are okay, special. Yeah. Um, but do you, are you working on any legislation with her that you might want to mention real quick? Yeah, so, uh, so you know, obviously I represent the town of Whitman and um, Representative Sullivan rep represents Whitman, excuse me, I represent the town of Hanson, she represents the town of Whitman, excuse me, and had my coffee this morning. And um, just like, you know, with former Representative Jeff Deal, we work together um, when it comes to um, trying to advocate for our regional schools and for our schools in general. Um, so we've been working together on some school-related issues, and also we actually just filed a bill together having to do with um, uh, a different kind of issue, public safety in terms of domestic violence prevention. We have some uh, tweaks to the law uh, in terms of public safety that we're looking to make to try to pr help folks uh, who have been vi victims of domestic violence. And so I know she has done some good work in her um, prior career on that topic, and so uh, we so thought it was a great idea to sort of team up together on this and have a nice bipartisan um, effort. So we're doing some work on domestic violence prevention and, and, and public safety, updating our statutes. And um, yeah, so that's that's been a good good uh, relationship. We know that the budget, uh, the, the, the governor has released his 2020 budget. I believe that's called House One. Yes. I know that it's now uh, gliding to House Two where We'll see the, the ways and means put forth their conversation before the House ultimately decides on House 2. G give me your thoughts on the budget process this year. Yeah, so um, in fact, we have our first um, sort of preliminary get together for our Ways and Means Committee tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a new Ways and Means Chairman this term. And um, as a returning member of the committee, you know, I have a good perspective having done all this the last two terms, the last two years, excuse me. And so our process will get underway pretty, pretty soon. In fact, I already had uh, a meeting, a one-on-one -on -one meeting with uh, the chairman to kind of express some of my priorities for the budget. Um, but so we'll have a series of hearings um, really getting underway later this month, uh, throughout the month of March, um, and uh, we'll dial, excuse me, delve into all the various areas of the budget and come up with our own um, ways and means budget, which we'll, we'll release um, in April. And so, we, you know, we look to House One, the governor's budget proposal, as a, a key starting point for that uh, process. And so obviously that has a lot of, uh, his, his proposal will have a lot of input into what we um, come up with and we sort of will try to build on that. And if there are areas we can do better, great. You know, and if, if not, we'll do whatever the best we can. But um, so that process is underway now and uh, we'll be certainly heating up over the next month to two months as we get that um, budget and hope to have a, a good process uh, this term. It's uh, worth noting that uh, as this uh, this program is, is airing, is right around the time that your uh, your art show, your student art show, yes. uh, is uh, is happening. Yep, we want to give a, a shout out. We have a great uh, student art show. This is the I think the seventh year I've done this now, um, where we uh, invite high school age students in uh, throughout my district to submit their art, uh, whether it's photography, mixed media, paintings, uh, whatever their um, drawings whatever their medium is, submit their art, and we have a great panel of judges um, 
who jury it, and then we display all the students' art, regardless uh, of the jury, uh, at the State House. And so it's a neat opportunity to showcase some of the great talented artists that we have here locally, give them a chance to have their work shown up at the State House, where you know thousands of visitors file in uh, every every um, every year or every week even. Um, so that uh, art show, uh, the deadline is is for submission is coming up. And uh, later in the spring, we'll actually have the artwork on display, and then we'll obviously publicize that when we do. But we're in the midst of collecting all the artwork, and uh, there's still time to submit. If folks out there listening want to check it out, you can go to my website and get all the details. But we'd love to have as many entries as we can. It's open to any student uh, age, nine, excuse me, uh, ninth grade to twelfth grade, in anywhere anywhere in my district. So, well, speaking of artwork, as as yeah. I, I hold this up, and you'll. Folks will be able to uh, see a, a larger image uh, as I'm holding it up, and that is is uh, your new book. Yes. Uh, Mob Town Massacre. Talk to me about uh, being, now adding, let's we'll see, legislator, <laughs> um, attorney, author. Author, yes. What was, what so, was it like to write this um, book? For folks who may not have heard, I uh, just published a book, which is um, now out, and you're holding it. Um, called Mob Town Massacre, and it's all about a gentleman named Alexander Hansen, who um, the town of Hansen was named after, and that was what generated my initial interest in this project. And, uh, you know, as I learned that this nice, quiet town of Hansen, Massachusetts, was named after a fiery Federalist newspaper editor from Maryland, circa 1812, and uh, how that story came to be sort of fascinated me. And so um, I spent the last really the last three years um, kind of working on this project in my spare time just here and there and um, did a lot of research and um, I don't want to give away all the good stuff but no, no. Uh, <laughs> but back in 1812 when the, when the, when the, uh, the United States was uh, uh, had declared war on Great Britain uh, Alexander Hansen was a, a newspaper editor in Baltimore and he published a newspaper called the Federal Republican and he was um, a fiery guy had a penchant for antagonizing <laughs> his political opponents, and they got uh, he published an editorial against the war, and that so irritated the populace in Baltimore that they attacked his newspaper, uh, and basically tore the building to the ground. Um, but instead of giving up, Hansen decided to fight back. He came back to the city the next month, and he recruited a whole cadre of uh, fellow Federalists to help him defend his newspaper including one man uh, named Lighthorse Harry Lee, who was the father of Robert E. Lee. Um, and so the men took up arms in this building in Baltimore in 1812, and they published their newspaper again, and they were attacked again. <laughs> and they had a siege that lasted into the night, and the men were transported towards the local jail for their protection. And the men, um, excuse me, the mob attacked them a third time, and broke into the jail, and basically, that's where the massacre comes in. Um, they killed one man, they tortured and brutally beat all of the Federalists, including Hansen. He, um, he was very gravely injured. Uh, one man was killed, and uh, Hansen did survive, and he escaped, and uh, he continued to publish his newspaper. And this incident, which became known as the Mob Town Massacre, um, made national news at the mm. time in uh, the summer of 1812 kind of stunned the nation, and um, it was the first time in our nation's history that uh, anyone had been killed in defense of the free press in the nation's history. So a lot of history was made, and uh, this guy Alexander Hansen was the leading character, and lo and behold, uh, when he passed away in 1819, the next year, the town of Hansen, Massachusetts was being split off of Pembroke, and so they named it after him. Very interesting. Mob That's Town the short Mass version. <laughs> Mob Town Massacre, Alexander Hansen, and the Baltimore Newspaper War of 1812. I only thought that it was just the the War of 1812, not necessarily that, that there was a newspaper uh, that was involved. This is fantastic. And we'll have to do a, a show dedicated to talking about your book. And I know that you also have, we just got a couple of moments left here, you also have a uh, a discussion and author's talk coming up in here yeah, soon, right? Yeah, in, in early April, yeah, I'll be doing a, 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 a presentation on the book and kind of what uh, what I've learned um, 
at the, the Hanson Library. So that'll be a uh, fun event. Look forward to that. Hey, we're, we're working on a screenplay. We're going <laughs> to see this thing be a Netflix original. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, that would be cool. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm just happy that you know I got to publish the book. Um, it's a pretty neat feeling to be able to be an do that. And, um, and know that you're exciting. doing it on something that was, I, I, I personally think it's one, one of your first loves. At least I think I, if I was to guess, I mean, being a former newspaper guy, yeah, it's, yeah. it's you know, it's right in your wheelhouse. It was, yeah. No, I really enjoyed it. And, you know, he just kind of lucked out that this was such an interesting character that was a great person to write about. So uh, I really enjoyed it. A lot of work, though. Let me tell you, people who write books for a living, I couldn't do that. It's, really? A lot of work. <laughs> and, and what's what's even better, what's interesting is, is that uh, you actually have uh, Congressman William Keating actually yeah. weigh he weighs in. You get a couple of different folks yeah. who, who actually weighed in on this on this book. And if I can get to the page, a, a compelling story that's as timely today as it was two centuries ago. That's pretty cool. And then of course, and you turn the page for Dad. Yes. Which is fantastic. Yeah. Dad would definitely uh, be proud. We've got a couple of moments left here. Anything we haven't touched upon, anything you want to mention in regards to the district or just for constituents who might want to reach out to you? Well, you know, like always, Kevin, you, you have done a masterful job of drawing out all the important stuff that's going on. So kudos to you. Um, if folks want to catch up, obviously happy to have folks come to office hours. We have every Friday rotating around to the local senior centers. Hop on my website at uh, www.joshcutler.com. And also, uh, and love to have folks come up and visit us at the State House as well. Uh, we had um, vacation week recently, and some folks came up, uh, brought the kids for a tour, which is always a great thing to do. So we uh, definitely encourage that. So um, we appreciate the opportunity to get on the show and talk about what's going on and look forward to doing it again. And, and of course, uh, Ryan and I have yet to talk about it, but you and I just had a, a brief discussion where we will We'll have to take a trip up there. Ryan and I had a great time a couple of years ago when we invaded your office. Yes. And Cody and uh, the, uh, the whole staff yes. were fantastic to us, and we're looking forward to uh, another trip up there. Uh, of course, Ryan, who's directing this program uh, today, along with Donnie road, Williams. Road trip. Road, road trip. Road trip. We'll have to bring Donnie <laughs> Williams with us as well so Donnie can uh, monitor our audio, so that'd be fantastic. Absolutely. I look forward to that. Well, thank you again for thank you, sir. for joining us. And again, that's another Crosstalk, 6th Plymouth District Edition, with the one and only, not only is he an attorney and a, a, law, a lawmaker, but he's also an author, uh, Josh Cutler. Until next time, you have been watching Crosstalk. Have